Hi, everybody. All, all few of you that are joining us this afternoon. Hopefully, we'll get a, a few more folks trickle on here. Um, but I'll go ahead and get started and introduce um, our presenter for today. This is the final uh, seminar in our Urban Water Innovation System series. Today, we're hearing from the Urban Water Innovation Network Director, Dr. Matt Dagarabi at Colorado State University. Dr. Arabi is the Borland, sorry, Borland Endowment Professor of Water Resources in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Colorado State University. His research, education, and service activities focus on the development of scientific approaches and analysis tools that enable integrated water resource management in a changing world. His primary expertise includes hydrologic assessment, watershed modeling, non-point source solution, and system identification and optimization. Dr. Arabi also serves as the director of the One Water Solutions Institute at CSU. Auzi coordinates synergistic activities at several multi-institutional research consortiums, including the Urban Water Innovation Network, the Clean Nutrient Center, and Water Sustainability and Climate Center. Dr. Arabi is the lead developer of an open source software called the Environmental Resource Assessment and Management System, also known as ERAMS. The ERAMS technology enables development of computationally scalable and accessible online tools for sustainable management of land, water, and energy resources. ERAMS currently hosts more than 200 data analytic and modeling web services that are frequently accessed by users from academic institutions, governmental agencies, and the private sector. Currently, ERAMS tools are used in 40 countries around the world, and one of the key technologies in the ERAMS platform is the integrated urban water model. Uh, that's a web-based model that enables the assessment of urban water demand management solutions. Um, and I don't think we're learning more about that today, but uh, I will go ahead and hand the controls over to Matt Deck, and he will take it away. Nasdaq, are you there? I can't. We can't hear you if you are there. Nasdaq, you may have muted yourself. There's a message here. It says from him, I'm on the call, but muted. Hmm. Do you control his uh, voice? I do sir? not. I don't. Um, but I just sent him a pin. I don't know if that'll, that'll work or not. You didn't disconnect. Hey, can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Okay. So I don't know what the reason for that was, but um, hopefully you can hear me well now. Should I go ahead? Yep, go for it. Okay, well, thank you guys for joining the uh, webinar. Uh, Sarah, I don't know if you want to um, let me and everybody else know who is on the call before I get started, if we don't have too many people on the call. Sure, yeah. Um, so we have myself and Matt Zakharabi, uh and Andre Dozier and Teresa Connor are here with me, as well as Dr. Neil Grigg, and it looks like we have Shirley Vincent and Carolina Moran as well. Thanks for joining us today, ladies. Oh, wonderful. Well, I, I would suggest since um, we have a limited number of people and Carolina is on the call and Shirley also with Neil, you may want to unmute everybody, let people ask questions if they have questions. So uh, if everybody puts their phones on mute, and then if you have any questions, please feel free to ask since we have a limited number of people on the call. Okay, well, again, thank you for joining the webinar. Um, I, will, I will discuss today a little bit uh, this project, Project D1, 2, and 1, 3, which is focused on reconciling data information and 
materials from other projects in addition to some of the research that we are doing in our um, in, within our projects here at CSU um, with regard to this um, synthesis activities and integration activities that uh, essentially guide developing a roadmap for uh, sustainable management of urban water systems. So uh, the work that I will present today um, uh, is um, essentially a reflection of the contributions from myself, Andre Dozier, who's a research scientist at CSU, uh, Gary Pivo at the University of Arizona has been a tremendous help with regard to the activities that um, we've designed and also the purposes of our framework. Teresa Connor has been very uh, um, instrumental and helpful in identifying partners outside of our research institutions and also ongoing efforts with regard to uh, sustainable air and water management. And then Wastapol, who is a master's student and will be graduating in May, um, will be joining us as a PhD student um, within the next semester. So we have a tremendous team and group that is working on this uh, specific project. Um, and we are very um, hopeful with regard to what we can produce. So, um, as most of you know, the context of Urban Water Innovation Network or the focus area for our research engagement and educational activities is on urban water systems, recognizing that um, perhaps water is um, our most critical natural resource and challenges with regard to water and water crisis are amongst the most critical sustainability challenges of 21st century. And these challenges are not necessarily only water shortage vulnerability or um, uh, the, you know, the flooding events that confront our communities, but include um, water quality, uh, degradation, environmental quality, um, our aging infrastructure and issues and uh, problems that arise from the aging infrastructure, and also a lot of regional problems because of these problems, you know, from eutrophication and issues uh, such as um, the hypoxic zones in Chesapeake Bay and Gulf of Mexico, and again, maybe the regional water shortage vulnerabilities in the southwest U.S. And throughout the world, a lot of these problems are interconnected. So the uh, management of urban water systems can have tremendous impacts on there are effective response to these um, challenges that confront communities throughout the world. Uh, and the issue really is that the urban water challenges are uh, very diverse. Um, and of course, uh, they are related and connected. And some of these problems are because our resources lim are limited and our systems, our water systems are stressed. Uh, and we continue to extract more demands from the services um, that are often aging and crippling in terms of the infrastructure in place to provide the services. Urbanization, population growth, and land use change also influence the uh, livability of our cities um, and the impacts of land use change and population growth on urban water systems has been well documented and the fact that tremendous pressures uh, are exerted on the systems uh, simply because in some areas we have uh, tremendous population growth and land use change that influence um, reliability and resiliency of the services. In some cities and some areas, these uh, problems are perhaps linked with losing populations, and some of the shrinking city or shrinking municipality issues are also very well documented. And perhaps some issues related to the Flint, Michigan, uh, with regard to um, policies that um, influence the access to safe and secure water and the issues that um, uh, caused a lot of problems, human health problems, or some of the examples of uh, these uh, shrinking city problems. And uh, of course, all of the decisions that we make for urban water systems are um, made under significant and deep uncertainties about future climate and future economic growth activities and many, many other factors that um, drive interactions among our uh, urban water systems. So recognizing these uncertainties and um, designing systems that can incorporate these uncertainties in robust decision-making processes are 
very important for city water systems. Um, as a part of our UWIN regional stakeholder workshops, uh, we've um, collected a very good data set of how stakeholders view problems, challenges that confront water systems, and also are important uh, considerations for solutions that may be relevant in uh, different regions. So in this particular figure, what you see is uh, factors that have been identified as important considerations in the Southeast Florida region, Sun Corridor in Arizona, Mid-Atlantic region, where uh, we met with stakeholders in Baltimore, Pacific Northwest, um, Portland, Eugene, and some other municipalities in that region, and Front Range with a focus on Denver, Fort Collins, and the Front Range of Colorado. As uh, the y-axis in this figure is a uh, percentage of attendees in these workshops that identified these particular issues as important issues. So you can see climate change variability and climatic extremes um, are very uh, often mentioned as very much important on the minds of stakeholders across regions. Water quality degradation and environmental protection and influence of urban settings on water quality and environmental protection is another factor of importance. Or again, aging infrastructure or in general considerations with regard to infrastructure and funding that is needed to not only put these infrastructure systems in place, but also perhaps maintaining those, um, the functions of these uh, systems uh, have been identified as some of the factors, stormwater and um, how to incorporate in stormwater management in or as a, a, a formal function of utilities is increasingly an important issue. And um, one uh, other factor that um, was very obvious in many, many regions is public awareness. Obviously, this is influenced by the type of challenges that confront different regions. For example, in Southeast Florida, things like sea level rise and climate change is Pretty well, it's well established that uh, the region needs to identify some solutions to these problems because of the imminent th threats to communities from these challenges and uh, pressures on the system. Um, there are a number of these factors that uh, have been identified and char characterized by our team. Uh, Jessica Bolson and Mike, uh, Mike Sukup led these efforts and uh, summarized some of these findings in a paper that uh, is under review in the water resources research. In, um, from the onset, when we started uh, thinking about how to come up with an assessment framework with regard to characterization of the state of water systems um, uh, in time and also um, as a function of the spatial location and geographic location, Gary Pipe and I have been thinking about how to, what are the factors that should be incorporated and considered in these processes. So what we initially designed was, um, you know, we need to look at a variety of urban outcomes that are influenced by the way we manage urban water systems. These include perhaps reliability of services. Think about water supply reliability, um, you know, flood control reliability and resilience and things, factors like that, the services that are provided by infrastructure systems and utilities that are in place to govern and manage this infrastructure, environmental quality, economic viability of, you know, not only cities but also regional economic vi viability, issues ar around shared responsibility, equity and social environmental justice issues, safety, livability, community health and cohesion of communities um, that are influenced by the way that our infrastructures are designed, planned, uh, implemented, and then, uh, of course, maintained. The, these urban outcomes or regional outcomes are influenced by a number of factors, driving forces and pressures on cities, you know, including population growth and land use change, and loss of critical natural and built infrastructure systems, aging infrastructure, obviously is very important, climate change, extreme events and hazards, but also by some activities within cities, land development, public works, economic development, consumer behavior, and so on. So for example, um, from our 
a research presentation by Dr. Tom Brown from U.S. Forest Service, Project A11. Uh, uh, the webinar is available from our webinar series. Uh, if, if we characterize water supply reliability for river basins across the United States, which was um, the context of the studies that Tom and uh, other folks at U.S. Forest Service teamed up with CSU to conduct, and we are enhancing those um, uh, studies now with um, uh, uh, more um, analysis around future climate and population growth and enhanced mechanism for capturing those. As you can see here, um, again, these studies have been conducted for all of our basins across the United States, but uh, if we focus on, for example, the South Flat River Basin, you can see water supply reliability uh, will decrease over the course of next uh, uh, this century, 21st century, as a function of the responses, hydrologic water quality and other responses of our systems to climate change and population growth and obviously the influence of changes in climate, particularly temperature and precipitation and water supply availability and uh, native water and then their influences uh, on trans space and water transfer. So you can see here on that right panel that uh, water supply reliability. This is regional water supply reliability and incorporates and includes um, vulnerability and reliability characterization for all sectors in the region, um, including municipalities and urban systems, but also agricultural systems and so on. And as you can see here, our reliability will, uh, will go down from pretty high reliability that we have now to uh, much more concerning reliability factors that one can compute. And of course, um, we've been studying and computing some of these factors um, uh, with regard to environmental and water quality. And if you, for example, um, consider how these reliability uh, uh, factors and considerations and vulnerability, vulnerability to water supply and water uh, shortage influence various economic sectors in a study that uh, was led by Andre Dozier and published in Environmental Research Letters. You can see that because of population growth changes in um, water supply availability and the fact that a, lot, a, a, a significant amount of water rights in the South Florida River Basin are, are still um, held by the agricultural sector, you can see land um, in uh, that irrigated cropland and land in production for agricultural production will diminish over the course of next century uh, and the rate of uh, this decline is really significant uh, because the front range of Colorado and this river basin, South Florida River Basin is experiencing tremendous population growth and the population of the region is expected to double by year 2050. So you can see that uh, uh, because of the way water rights are managed and the way water supply systems will be influenced by availability of water and demand for water, under new adaptation strategy, uh, we will have a uh, substantial decline in irrigated lands as a significant economic sector in this region. Uh, with some infrastructural adaptation, with, which um, in this particular case is focused on um, water conservation in ag systems and urban water conservation and some reservoir uh, enhancements and new reservoirs that have been proposed in this region, we can, re um, um, uh, uh, we can essentially mitigate some of these effects to some level. Of course, if the population of the region continues to grow, um, some of these technologies will, and infrastructure systems will help to some level uh, and perhaps we have a delayed decline in uh, irrigated ag agricultural areas in, in our systems. In, in our work, we've looked at not only technological and infrastructure solutions, but also uh, institutional solutions with regard to managing the systems under free market or fixed market and uh, the various type of policies that can be put in place for management of water rights in the system or uh, tying irrigated lands with the amount of water that is endowed for agricultural production and so on. So the point here is that water shortage vulnerability, uh, perhaps very important for urban areas, has substantial and tremendous implications for regional 
economic viability of various sectors, not only urban and municipal sector, but also agricultural sector. And all of these other urban outcomes that you can see here also is important in our characterization for making more robust decisions and also integrated decisions. So obviously we need transitions to, uh, to, um, to respond to these pressures on our systems and driving forces that challenge our water systems. And these transitions uh, can be categorized, or the way we at least have been looking at it, uh, can be categorized under technological solutions and pathways, policy and institutional pathways and uh, financial pathways. Our projects across UN, across the UN network um, uh, tackle and address various considerations that can be uh, categorized under these um, pathways that we can see here. So our underlying principle in designing our studies and also the way we organize our information is that perhaps this um, one water approach that has becoming uh, more and more um, the context of a lot of recent uh, coalitions and efforts it could be a, a good way of going forward. And often folks ask, what is you know what 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 is the purpose or what is the basic what are the basic principles of the one water approach? And the way at this we we have been communicating the one water approach. Um, is considerations that can be categorized under two um, classes. One is, or transition. One is transitioning from managing water systems from a service provision model to a resource management model. And this is something that Teresa, uh, who is a significant partner in our project, has been uh, highlighting from the very onset that we need to understand how this transition can be put in place, not only technologically, but also from a policy and institution and financial point of view. And the second component of the one water approach is to transition from management of our systems in silos to an integrated water management. So in the context of integrated water management, uh, the goal is to um, perhaps find mechanisms that uh, allow more coordinated and aligned actions uh, amongst utility, um, components of utilities and utility groups, but also perhaps in the broader sense at the watershed and river basin level, interactions and in integration among the functions of different sectors and how water um, systems are managed. So drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, and then transitioning towards a water-wise city as uh, folks at the International Water Association have been promoting and uh, uh, hopefully tapping into rainwater and stormwater, groundwater, wastewater, re recycled water, and drinking water in a holistic and integrated fashion and managing the system in an optimal, um, in an optimal manner. And the whole, the, again, this concept of resource management is we need to look at water as an integral component of our urban systems, our municipalities that access to the water for drinking purposes, but also fishing and swimming and uh, the enhancing the livability of our, our communities is, uh, is very important. So many groups have been working on this issue or at least uh, contributing to the purposes and definition of one water. These groups include the International Water Association, Water Environment and Research Foundation, Water Research Foundation, U.S. Water Alliance, American Water Works Association, and so on. So you can see here is a screenshot of the IWA's definition of or purposes and um, underlying principles in, involved in uh, water sensitive cities where, again, we don't go uh, through this linear approach of moving water for uh, as a service to different sectors, consuming and then waste, creating waste and then disposing waste in a linear fashion uh, and going um, towards systems that allow us to recycle and reuse resources, recover resources, recycle water and reuse it, and, and uh, uh, add co-benefits or in, improve co-benefits that can be gained by um, uh, this water-sensitive management of our resources and systems. So again, there are a number of these reports that are available from 
uh, in different formats, but also in um, reports that can be accessed from IWA, Water Research Foundation, U.S. Water Alliance, WARF's Pathway to One Water, U.S. Uh, there, there, a, there are a number of guidelines and blueprints for on-site water reuse and water reuse um, that uh, have been put together by City of San Francisco, utilities, and so on. So. Many of these uh, uh, factors and issues that we will be discussing are uh, uh, based on some of these findings and discussions by these groups. So our initial definition and purposes of the One Water is to improve the availability and reliability of water services, not only for current conditions, but obviously uh, making sure they're available for future generations. Um, we need to make sure that our systems are resilient to changes in the system, and these, these changes could be social, economic, and environmental. Uh, often these changes are not, um, they're unforeseen, they're not predicted, and therefore we need to uh, identify components of our systems that are uh, most vulnerable to changes that um, perhaps are very difficult to anticipate and for, um, forecast. And obviously increasing co-benefits of our water system for flood protection, energy footprint, and also in the broader sense, human, uh, community and human health considerations and co-benefits um, are extremely important. And one approach um, or one component that has been the uh, one of the key components of our studies is how water planning and management can be reconciled and incorporated within the broader urban and regional planning efforts. So with this, our project goals are to categorize information, data, and systems that we put together to be able to um, bring these factors and organizing principles together. Again, as you can see here, some of these factors focus on reliable, secure, and resilient water supply. Obviously, environmental and water quality control indicators become very important flood protection and resilience, community health factors, livability, and economic vitality, viability, and uh, even at personal level, personal income factors that can be um, related or are influenced by the way we manage our water and link system. So in, in this particular project, we focus on collecting a lot of urban water data, um, existing data and information in our study regions, um, from previous efforts like the Water Sustainability and Climate Project or from the, um, the, the other the sustainability research networks that we are closely working with. There are a number of um, other studies that have produced tremendous amount of data and uh, information that uh, we are using. And of course, stakeholders in these regions have been very active uh, understanding what factors influence these uh, sustainability challenges in this region. So we are co working with uh, not only our researchers, but also stakeholders to collect the data. We also want to create a, a, a very flexible website and app that allows um, other communities to share their data and information in a fashion and in a manner that can be used to categorize these uh, indicators, these uh, you know, assessment categories and factors that are important for um, assessing how systems can transition from this fragmented management of urban water systems and perhaps not very resilient to a more sustainable, resilient, and more integrated system. Um, this data and information will be linked to top-down and bottom-up optimization and decision analysis, and then um, these will be uh, these, these approaches will be used to explore trade-offs. Uh, you know, and these trade-offs could be again characterized from different perspectives and lenses, economic, social, environmental, um, and evaluate feasibility, um, why, um, uh, perhaps um, some of the socioeconomic viability of these solutions and um, the impacts of these solutions on achieving these urban outcomes that I highlighted earlier in the presentation. And obviously, at the end, one of the key contributions of this type of approaches is to identify solutions. Again, solutions are those technological, policy, institutional, and financial pathways that I highlighted before that could help um, 
uh, these transitions in different regions, and then we want to obviously learn whether there are some common um, common solutions or perhaps common approaches can, that can be adopted in different regions or for municipalities within a region. This information uh, uh, will be summarized or we're working on summarizing this information from various case studies and the studies that we are doing to, uh, to be able to do perhaps four major um, uh, categories of information that will, um, will comprise our essentially one water roadmap. And this is, uh, these are focused on defining the essential characteristics of urban water systems, again, pointing decision makers towards best decisions, obviously in the context of sustainability analysis, shared experiences and peer learning is very important. And the backbone or the cornerstone of staying or adding resiliency to systems is to stay agile in responding to future needs, changes in the system. Again, some of these changes perhaps forcing and in, in most cases unforeseen and unpredicted changes in our, in our system. Some of these um, um, factors or categories of information will be um, assessed uh, by a number of indicators that we are evaluating these indicators. The way that we think about this is um, indicators should be characterized according to spatial and temporal scales that are appropriate for their quantification, for their characterization and quantification. So I just made a very short attempt for the purposes of this presentation to highlight that our spatial scales will look at household scale factors and indicators, neighborhood scale information that will also benefit from the household scale characterization of sustainability indicators. This information will inform municipal scale indicators and finally regional scale analysis um, of our system. So perhaps again, this is not all inclusive. This is a work in progress, as I will uh, highlight as, we go, uh, as I mentioned, our methods for um, refining these, uh, these indicators. Uh, perhaps one can think about water usage as a function of the type of uh, building types or household types energy usage uh, with regard to the type of um, you know, fixtures and uh, other type of um, uh, utilities that are available at different um, households with different zoning categories that can be incorporated, and carbon footprint. And one of the important factors that some of our research projects obviously are looking at is likelihood of adoption and consumer behavior. So. These are some of the indicators that we will be looking at, for example, at the household level. We summarize this information at the household level to look into some factors that are perhaps most, uh, are most appropriate to be characterized at the neighborhood scale. Perhaps livability at the neighborhood level, community health. Uh, for example, one can think about um, heat effects on human health or illnesses or deaths. Equity and community cohesion, um, uh, perhaps biodiversity and biological uh, ecological functioning, um, as a function of the type of neighborhood that we develop and um, people live in, would be uh, some of the factors that we include. And then at municipal level, obviously, we will again benefit and we will define our indicators based on household and neighborhood scale indicators to look at things like what is the water system level, and this, by system level I'm talking about perhaps utility and municipal level, water supply, reliability, pollution control, reliability and resiliency, uh, the capacity of the city to recover resources and reuse them, and perhaps um, whether a system, a municipality or a city has adequate management and financial capacity to respond to changes in the system or provide uh, reliable services for the, uh, for the citizens of our city. And then at regional level, we'll benefit from all of this to look at perhaps things like flood protection, public health and wellness, shared responsibility and inclusiveness, and economic vitality and viability of different sec uh, sectors. One thing that I want to highlight is that there may be some indicators that may be characterized and will be characterized 
at a variety of scales, not only in space, but also in time. Uh, and um, uh, this approach of looking at disaggregation in space and time will allow us to ensure that our characterization and quantification of urban water sustainability indicators are consistent across temporal and spatial scales. Um, we've been looking into organizing frameworks for these indicators or our assessment. We've looked at the pressure, pressure and states responses framework, uh, drivers pressure, states impacts and responses framework, and all, obviously the triple bottom line approach as um, organizing concepts in our analysis. And a, a number of um, indicators that we're looking at are being characterized and quantified within a risk-based approach. As I mentioned, in the water supply vulnerability analysis, for example, we look at reliability as the probability that supply is greater than demand on an annual basis. So this stochastic reliability and risk-based approaches are very suitable for a lot of our indicators that are, we, are, uh, we are measuring. Of course, not everything can be quantified that way, and some of our metrics will be quantified with other appropriate uh, measurements and quantification techniques, either deterministic or perhaps more qualitative characterization of these systems. We are in the process of developing uh, or refining our initial proposed framework. Um, so in the initial phase, which is the focus of this year activities, we are building our framework. This is, um, we have a working group, column indicator, an assessment working group, that um, about 25 people who have uh, participated so far and uh, have been engaged in this in this process, and uh, then obviously we are building on our interactions with regional stakeholders. And once we have a reasonable draft of our framework indicators, the characterization and methods of quantification, we'll make this available for the global community and particularly our partners. Um, across regions in the United States and other areas that we're working uh, with um, to, to react to our proposed framework, to provide data for uh, demonstrating the framework and serving as test for for um, these areas. So Andre has put together a survey that we are going through with our stakeholder groups. You can see here that a couple of screenshots of the survey. Um, you can see the survey provides a way of capturing comments also provide some basic information with regard to definitions that have been proposed by various groups and uh, entities with regard to one water. So you can see here some definitions from U.S. Water Alliance, Water um, Environment and Real Foundations and so on. And then uh, we have a large list of indicators that have been uh, again categorized under the various organizing principles. Uh, these broad categories of information that I mentioned as um, is perhaps different lenses through which we will evaluate one more approaches. And this information essentially will allow us to prioritize and perhaps um, uh, uh, shorten the list of really the most essential indicators that we need to uh, include in our analysis. So we are going through this process. Our hope is that by early next year, this will be available for communication with the broader community. And the solutions that we are looking at are infrastructure systems. We are particularly interested in water conservation um, in urban areas, both indoor and outdoor conservation. But in some cases, also, we are looking at um, systems that are related to agriculture and energy systems. So, because again, obviously, water is a shared resource among various economic sectors. Uh, we are looking at systems that promote resource recovery and reuse. Uh, very important for us is fit for purpose use of water. So these different um, sources of alternative sources of water can be used for various purposes. Um, hybrid centralized, decentralized systems, green infrastructure, and sustainable urban drainage systems. And a number of our uh, policy and institutional um, pathways that are being considered and financial pathways that are being considered are focused on the integration of water management with regional planning. So 
once this information are collected, we put things in the context of uh, optimizing the functions of the systems. Uh, obviously, we have various lenses to evaluate the performance and assess the functions of various solutions that I mentioned. And uh, one can obviously characterize these um, indicators and the, uh, the grouping and um, organizing principles that I mentioned into some objective functions that will be optimized or will be used as objective functions for optimization of our systems. So if, if for example, one wants to look at cost of the system versus the long-term resilience of our wire systems, and you can see that if you are trying to minimize both of these objective functions, uh, because perhaps the way they are formulated, we can identify how we can move from our current conditions to a more integrated um, management and more optimal or perhaps improved uh, and enhanced management of our systems uh, by comparing where we are now and where we are going without any adaptation, as I uh, demonstrated in one of the examples in the South Southern Basin. And then um, if we adopt more integrated policy, institutional, and financial approaches for managing, management of our systems or perhaps some technological solutions. Each solution then will be linked with uh, multi-criteria decision analysis. So these are components of our decision innovation dashboard that will allow the communities to identify or explore where they are now, where they are going, and um, how these um, factors can be reconciled to identify most appropriate or solutions that are most consistent with their preferences in responding to the changes in the system or delivering services that are important for the regions. So these uh, top-down optimization approaches are really tremendously useful for studying systems, but perhaps uh, uh, could really leave out some important considerations that are difficult to characterize in mathematical and analytical approaches to this type of system. So we are also looking at other approaches for bottom-up optimization of systems, such as stakeholder-driven scenario building and perhaps some uh, uh, games that can be put together to identify these approaches. Uh, you can, what you can see here is um, some of the results of the study that Andre did for his PhD. And what you can see here, um, it, an example of this, uh, this hydroeconomic optimization of our systems where uh, the green point shows where we are, the baseline or status quo or no adaptation um, uh, strategy in the South River Basin. And then this system level integrated assessments of cost of water for municipalities or acquiring water for municipalities versus agricultural profits um, uh, in terms of crop production and also the value of water. So you can see uh, th th we've done some of this work already in some of our systems. This is an example of the results that uh, can be evaluated and the trade-offs between agricultural production versus cost of water for municipalities uh, in billion dollars. So you can see there are ways of improving the systems the solutions that have been evaluated in this particular case are building new storage systems, um, enhancing irrigation technology in both urban areas and agricultural sectors to more efficient systems, uh, upgrading toilets in uh, residential areas for improved efficiency, zero scaping, and all of the strategies together. So you can see if you consider all of the strategies together, um, we have um, so the type of solutions that can be considered in combination or we are considering combination of these solutions can be evaluated in contrast with potentially optimal solutions. So in this case, in this case, I'm talking about the multi-objective optimization of the system. So there are rooms for improvements from a technological and infrastructure point of view. And also um, we've looked at how different policy and institutional agreements and settings influence the way our water systems are managed and perhaps sustainability of water systems. So in the panel on the right, you can see, again, the baseline versus different policy instruments, including um, 
not allowing any buy and dry of irrigated um, agriculture or 50% buy and dry versus um, and also a solution where you, you, we don't impose any cap of water, uh, share of water from some specific reservoir systems in this region. And uh, the raw water requirements uh, solutions that you can see here is essentially the relationship between uh, land development and water use. So raw water requirements, um, right now in, in, in Colorado, there are specific requirements for purchasing water rights and acquiring water rights per unit of development. So if you relax those by some amounts, by 90% or 80%, so you can see that the system will move towards a more sustainable management of the system. Obviously, has impact on land that will remain in agricultural production and agricultural profitability versus cost to municipalities for acquiring water. And again, there are a number of other indicators that we have quantified in this exercise. The other example I wanted to highlight is uh, the National Western Center in Denver. So the previous results I showed are regional type of indicators and assessments. At the uh, neighborhood scale, in this case, one of our test sets is the National Western Center in Denver, Colorado, one of the largest planned community revitalization projects, substantial resources allocated to this project. And as you can see here, uh, over the course of the next decade, this area will go from a pretty a, a hard escape without that much of green space to a much more livable, a much greener environment where perhaps not only uh, water systems are immediately influenced by this um, urban revitalization project, but also communities who live in the adjacent areas can experience a much improved uh, um, community health and livability. So we are measuring how we will measure as the project is uh, built, how various components of the water system in, are influenced by green infrastructure, stormwater management, resource recovery and reuse. But also we will be monitoring experiences of citizens of that community around various type of infrastructure, gray infrastructure versus green, and uh, we would, that will certainly uh, would be used as a test bed where we can link green and gray infrastructure planning, management, and operation with broader community health indicators. So here's an example that um, some of the preliminary results of uh, our studies that we've been involved with the sustainability studies for this particular campus. Teresa, Andre, and some of our other colleagues at One Water Solutions have been very much engaged with this analysis. So you can see if we look at different uh, or alternative water sources for various uses, you know, potable water, reclaimed water, um, black water, gray water, and so on for toilet flushing, landscape, and different purposes, we can uh, you know, as you can see, compared to baseline and projected demand for water, this particular campuses um, or water use for this neighborhood will can be substantially reduced by adopting some of these alternative water uses for different end uses. And obviously, when we talk about fit for purpose use of water, um, the attractive feature of that which essentially focuses on the fact that we, or the principle that we don't need to um, treat water to the same level or to the maximum level required, the best level required for drinking water to use it for, for example, toilet flushing or irrigation. So you can see in the bottom panel that the level of treatment is influenced by the type of alternative water sources that are considered. So level of treatment is a surrogate in this case for uh, cost is a surrogate for carbon footprint, is a surrogate for energy demand, and so on. So you can see, for example, if you use black water for toilet flushing and landscape irrigation, storm water for toilet flushing and irrigation, gray water for this, and then um, uh, other combinations of alternative sources for different uses, we can really improve the, uh, the sustainability indicators uh, for this particular campus. So again, this, this kind of test sets will be used in our studies to develop our decision um, tools for um, the broader uh, 
um, for, for different regions across the country. Again, uh, we will have multiple test steps across regions in the country to to be able to um, finalize our roadmap, tools, modeling, and data infrastructure that we will put together to uh, to be used by communities, and also the Wild Connect, which is ultimately the place where this information will be managed. So uh, again, as I mentioned, um, we are working also on a number of computational and uh, computational tools for stakeholder-driven decision making and scenario building, and also games. So the concept here is that again, with that multi-objective optimization approach that I mentioned, one can look at the scenario building exercises to characterize. Um, whether there are socioeconomic factors that influence decision making for the water system. For example, are there male biases or gender biases um, in, in decision making? Are there race biases in decision making? And so on. And this data would be, again, very, very important for us to be able to uh, characterize how we can revitalize our uh, communities and add. Uh, equity considerations and social environmental justice considerations and community health and visibility in the way we manage our system. So uh, this uh, advantage of these approaches um, are that, uh, as I mentioned, technical optimization and some of these mathematical programming approaches do not necessarily allow characterization of all possible important factors. There are certainly factors that we won't be able to characterize. And these type of scenario building uh, activities would allow us to identify places where mathematical programming falls short in terms of um, identifying system trade-offs in meeting the desired targets for water management. So again, this is an example of the game. Uh, again, uh, Andre is the primary developer of the tool. It's called the Dipsa game. You can see a, an example of this game um, that is being developed. Uh, this can be used to evaluate various, uh, you know, research recovery and reuse systems, landscape irrigation, and so on. Uh, and hopefully, it will be available sometime soon for data collection from these different regions that are um, the focus of our initial study. So, with that, I'll stop here, um, and um, we'll be glad to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Mazdaq. Um, I know some people are having some issues with their microphones, so if you have a question, I'd be happy to unmute you. Uh, we can get a little dialogue started. You can raise uh, can your hand you or enter something into the chat queue. Oh, Neil, is that you? Yeah, can you hear me? Sure can. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll have a quick question before you get some more. Um, what does success look like, um, Mazdak? A lot of different pieces are impressive in um, what's going on here, but when it comes to the integration of the full project at the end of the project, what would success look like in all of this? So I'm guessing, Neil, you mean by success is the success of this project in delivering specific products. Um, uh, you said that in terms of our project, there are three elements that are very important for us. One is um, just scientific exploration, identifying, you know, underlying trade-offs in managing the way water, water is managed in our systems at the neighborhood level, at municipal level, and regional level. So these are uh, obviously important for any project that we do in academic settings, um, and this exploration would hopefully result in a number of papers and things of that sort. So that's one uh, key factor for us, to be able to identify these underlying trade-offs among various factors and how they are related to scale, both spatial and temporal. The second uh, important factor for us is to have the capacity to put these data sets that are being generated by our researchers from different projects, as well as data that are, are, that are available from previous studies, and more importantly, perhaps, from stakeholders in different regions. Just collecting those, organizing them, and making them available in a, in a way that they can be used for characterization and quantification of these, uh, these various factors is extremely important for us. Uh, obviously, 
an extremely difficult task because um, you know we have more than 100 researchers and faculty and senior personnel that are working on this project. So that's a challenge, but we definitely remain committed to make sure uh, that's the way that uh, we put this together. And finally, uh, the final product is this blueprint, this roadmap. Our hope is really to produce a decision tool, a, um, an expert system, or some sort of a, an app that can enable communities to understand where they are now, where they are going on the future, anticipated and perhaps some unforeseen changes in the system, and what type of solutions would help them, uh, what type of adaptation and mitigation strategies would help them to respond to those challenges. So design and deployment and then dissemination of that tool will, will be the third part of our activities in terms of um, um, measures of success of our project or this particular Again. project I highlighted. Very good. It makes me think that in terms of getting back to the stakeholders in the different regions, if you take that second goal and you want to provide some data about what things look like in the different regions, it might be interesting to create some kind of a standard data format for sustainability of the regional urban water systems, integrated systems, that would be unique and not something that they already have in their planning departments. So create uh, some kind of a framework like that and let the um, different uh, cities choose uh, what their particular um, priorities might be relative to whether they're in the mountain zone or the coastal zone or something like that. And then just pr provide the data, you know, uh, to them like you said. That might be a useful output. That was just a thought that came to my mind. Yep, yep. That's certainly something that we are very interested in. The, the building blocks for storage and retrieval of information and also perhaps uh, coming up with some dashboards that can be very easily used to uh, to understand where municipalities are relative to their uh, to their peers or where they can be, where, you know, where, what type of approaches or strategies or pathways could help them based on these case studies that either we are doing or other communities have shared with us in terms of directions of their future programs. So that's, that's really the backbone of our um, success story. If there will be a success story, that will be the most important one. Yeah, if you came up with a standard framework to display the data, and then it could be used for benchmarking so they could compare against the other regions, um, that would be something uh, great. They would they would want to do that. There would be a lot of interest in that. Thank you, Neil. And uh, Andre is also on the call, so I'm hoping he is listening to this, and this gives him more energy to even be more committed to the level of the system. Or this, this particular product. Is there any other questions? Yeah, yeah, there is one other question, um, and I'll add that Dr. Charvel is on the line too. Um, but Carolina is wondering if we could share our sources or approaches to estimating demand reduction using alternative water strategies. Sorry, can you repeat that please again? Can you share? Uh, uh, Carolina, Carolina is asking. Yes. Uh, Again, it's can, a you share, it's a question. can you share sources or approaches to estimate demand using, sorry, demand reduction using alternative water strategies? Yeah, of course, of course. This is the, uh, the, the, the study that I shared with you for this community revitalization project is based on the IUWM model, the Integrated Urban Water Model. Uh, Dr. Charvel is the primary developer of the tool, but Many of us have been engaged in that process. The model now has been calibrated fully for Front Range of Colorado. We have data from Miami and um, other regions like Phoenix and LA and other groups are collecting data for many, many regions. As a matter of fact, Andre now is uh, working with one of our students to collect data for 300 municipalities in the US to calibrate the model for the entire country and then the model will be is uh, indeed is readily available right now. If you go to iran.com slash IUWM, the model is available for estimating 
uh, or forecasting urban water demand for residential from residential and other sectors in cities, and then um, evaluating the benefits or effects of different strategies. Um, we are hoping that Carolina will do this obviously for Miami and the Southeast Florida region, but particularly for the Broward County and the type of solutions that or uh, scenarios that um, folks in the in the county want to evaluate. And, and I did just drop the, the link into the chat queue, so um, hopefully you can see that. Yeah, and then there are a lot of uh, reports and uh, previous studies that have been used in the design and deployment of the IUWM model. So, uh, Carolina, if you're interested, uh, we can send you a full list of, you know, these residential end user studies and more local or regional studies in, in the southeast, southeast Florida region that um, we would be more than glad to share with you. Yeah, she said she's having trouble with her microphone, but she said, perfect. So as we advance with Broward County data calibration, we might have the same comparisons for our alternative strategies. This is very interesting to share with our stakeholders. Perfect timing. Great, great. I had a question, Mazdek. Can you guys hear me okay? This is Shirley. Sure can. Hi, Shirley. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. Thank you. Um, and I say it looks like all your sustainability indicators are pretty universal across all systems and regions. Is is that correct? Or are they going to be well, customized? Uh, uh, Shirley, we I did not include all of the options that we are considering. There is a very long list of indicators that we've considered. Um, we are going through an exercise this this process that is referred to as Delphi process where initially our researchers and uh, regional stakeholders hopefully will help us to categorize these indicators and metrics for each region. Obviously everybody that's contributing to this um, uh, perhaps rating of these indicators and how they should be organized, uh, their ratings will reflect their um, regional concerns about water systems and the way they should be treated. So perhaps some of this will be uh, embedded in the, the way we categorize our information and there will be some regional aspects to this. But uh, right now we are considering uh, all of these for all of the regions. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, not all of these indicators will be evaluated at every scale. So some of them are more appropriate for building scale characterization of sustainability approaches or solutions. Some will be appropriate for neighborhood, municipal, and then ultimately regional. So I think there will be differences based on where people contribute to this prioritization of indicators and metrics. Um, but we will learn these as we go through this internal process and then hopefully making these um, systems available for the broader community to let us know what they think in terms of metrics and indicators. Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering what level of customization there would ultimately be. Uh, prioritization is one thing, uh, but just drop, you know, not looking at some indicators in a specific region, or would they be there, they just wouldn't be prioritized. Anyway, it sounds like that's a work in progress trying to figure out how that's going to work. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Again, we've done a significant literature review to see what other people have suggested. Mm -hmm. We've added some other information that reflects, uh, you know, what we internally think. But one of the advantages of our network is that we have researchers and experts that have interdisciplinary backgrounds. So people from engineering background or natural science backgrounds, people who understand biology and ecology, people who design optimization techniques. So our hope is that this is, or at least the way we think about this is that this really unique group and coalition of researchers and experts embedded in um, or perhaps enhanced by some of our regional stakeholder inputs can help us come up with a list of robust list of indicators that we should be measuring in different regions. Yeah, if you ha do have a universal set, it, it would be cool because then you could have like some sort of ranking. Uh, and it was still have a regional aspect to it, of course, because different regions are going to have different things that are most important in terms of uh, reaching solutions. But it would be very interesting sure. to 
will respond to that kind of the, like how are we doing compared to not just other regions like us but you know across the United States and even internationally so if you had some sort of universal set that could absolutely one, yeah so absolutely so cool to think about yeah. is, it, the sound of metrics definitely will be available for cross-site comparisons and pure learning mm -hmm. uh, and we at least will have a set of these indicators that are suitable for that purpose for municipal and regional comparison. I think that's definitely something that uh, will um, will emerge from this exercise that we are doing. You know, think about water use efficiency or financial capacity and um, decision-making capacity of, of, of utilities for an integrated approach to water management. Or something, something, some of these factors will be suitable for cross-site and regional and municipal comparisons mm -hmm. um, that will also be used in some of the publications that we'll be putting together. You know, what we learned from comparing these different municipalities and cities using a consistent set of metrics across the regions. Right. Wonderful work. It's all very exciting. Thank you. All right, are there any, any more questions or comments for Matt, Zach, and Andre? Not, not seeing anything new pop up, so thank you for your time today, everyone. We'll be sure to send out the link to this on our YouTube channel once I get it posted. Uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season and you're all staying warm out there. Thank you, Sarah. Same to everyone. Bye. Take care, Shirley. Bye-bye.